Um, so, so good morning. I see uh, the sun is popping its head out today, even though we're in the throes of autumn. The radar is looking a little drier uh, right across the state, which is great to see. So hopefully some of you out there are enjoying the sun after this forum. Um, you know, and before we before we kick off into into anything too serious, um, I'd just like to say on behalf of State Archives and Records, um, I'd like to welcome you all today to the Records Managers Online Forum. Uh, I acknowledge that I am hosting this webinar from the lands of the Darug people, uh, who are the traditional custodians of the land where I live. Uh, I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we all work or gather today virtually. Um, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this webinar. Uh, I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, and I'd like to celebrate the diversity of the Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. Um, so, so with all of that, um, so with all of that uh, sort of intro there, um, we've got some really exciting stuff coming up today. Um, just in terms of the agenda, I'll do a quick, quick run through. We've got um, We've got our executive director who's come along here, um, Adam Lindsay, uh, to give us an update on the State Records Act review and future directions. Uh, we have the most excellent Gillian Wood from Transport for New South Wales um, to talk to us about uh, you know, some of the fun things they've done on their journey to implementing Microsoft 365. Um, and then we have two people from State Archives and Records who will probably be familiar faces to most of you. We have Christy Tiberi and Catherine Robinson to talk to us about uh, some new things that we're doing, some new technology that we've put in to do them um, in the hope that, uh, you know, we can we can do some great things moving forward in a very customer centric way. Um, and then we'll sort of have some updates at the back. Now, most of these sessions have questions after the main content, uh, question time allocated after the main content has been presented. So if you can hold your questions to the end, then that's good. Um, so it is, it's 10.33. So if Adam doesn't mind, we might kick off with the, uh, with the first, the first presentation, the State Records Act Review and Future Directions. So Adam Lindsay is the Chief Executive Officer of New South Wales State Archives and Records um, and Sydney Living Museums. So Adam joined SAR in 2017 um, and uh, soon after that, 2018, I think, became the Executive Director of SARA um, and then began leading Sydney Living Museums as its Executive Director in July 2019. Uh, Adam brings to us and we benefit from his 14 years of experience in senior leadership roles within uh, various government, um, both federal and state um, and different cultural institutions. So I'll hand over to Adam. Thanks Andrew, kind of didn't expect a, a, a nice intro like that. So thank you, I, I appreciate the kind kind words. Uh, hi everyone, as Andrew said, my name's Adam Lindsay. Uh, it's really great to see how many people, there's 204, six, eight, 10, 211 people by my count on, on the call this morning. So that's a really fantastic turnout and the agendas are a packed one. So I will do my very best to keep to time. I'm gonna share my screen in a moment uh, and go through a presentation. If you've got a question during the presentation, by all means, put your hand up or type it into the chat function. Um, I'll ask Irene or one of the team to monitor that chat function so I don't get too distracted trying to read and present at the same time. Um, and very happy to answer questions throughout the presentation, but we'll also do my very best to keep at least 10 or, or hopefully more minutes at the end for your questions. So with that said, uh, I'm going to share my screen now and show you the presentation. I will make it full screen. I'm presuming everyone can see that. Excellent. So uh, the presentation today is about the State Archives and Records Authority of New South Wales uh, and the State Records Act review and the policy position that's being advanced to create two new entities. The first one being Museums of History of New South Wales and the second one being the State Records Authority of New South Wales. So as I go through this presentation, as I said, I will, I will do the clinical presentation first uh, and then we will stop for questions uh, at the end. Sorry, I'm having a bit of technical difficulty. There we go. State Records Act Review will establish a history-focused cultural institution. 
So where we're at now, we've got a white paper that's been issued to the Social Commission uh, Issues Committee uh, in December 2021 and was published in February 2022. If you haven't read that white paper and are interested in the detail, particularly as it surrounds the changes to the State Records Act, that, that is possibly the best resource at this stage um, to discover in detail what those policy positions are. Uh, but I will do my best to summarise them in this presentation. In terms of the rest of the timeline, we have uh, lodged in a cabinet uh, a uh, cabinet minute to go to cabinet to consider these policy positions and approve the finalisation of a draft new bill to Parliament and a revised State Records Act to go to Parliament. We're expecting that to be looked at by the cabinet in early May and to go to Parliament soon after. I can't really give a firm date on when that will go to Parliament because that's a political decision and, and clearly one that the Minister will um, be minded to determine as, uh, as is his prerogative. We're seeking a commencement date of 31 December 2022. And at that, that's the point where we would ask Parliament to have the two new acts, the Museums of History New South Wales Act, and the amended State Records Act come into being. Uh, and of course, we've got, uh, we're asking for a 12 month period from the start of the State Records Act for the new provisions to come into place. So that we will have a year of the Act being in place to support you through any changes and implications. And also hopefully up to six months lead time by the time the Act's assented to, to it uh, coming into force, to communicate with you and support you. The two significant changes since the last period of consultation with public officers were, uh, are instead of a single institution, because when the uh, then minister originally conceived of this proposal, uh, he wanted SARA and SLM, State Archives and Sydney Living Museums, to merge together polis bolus in their entirety. Following consultation with the state, uh, uh, with the Social Issues Committee rather, uh, and through their inquiry process, we've refined that proposal to be, rather than creating one institution, putting the regulatory part of what State Archives does on its own, and the collection and commercial part of SARA combining with Sydney Living Museums to form a new cultural institution. And I'll, I'll show you a diagram on the next slide that explains that in a little more detail. The other significant change since uh, our last consultation was the publication of the Operation Dash Up report by ICAC. And I will go through in a later slide the changes we've made to our policy positions as a result of that report. Now, the next slide I'm going to go through uh, really details what I was talking about before, uh, how the current situation moves into the new situation. So the blue and the red boxes are currently what happens. The Historic Houses Act of 1980 enables Sydney Living Museums, and the State Records Act 1998 enables the State Archives and Records Authority of New South Wales. Under each of those respectively are uh, one box for Sydney Living Museums because their foundations uh, and functions are considered as one and will novate into the new Museums of History Act that will enable Museums of History New South Wales. If we think of State Records Act's functions split roughly and crudely into two, the policy and regulation of record keeping as one, uh, that will move into an amended State Records Act, and that will enable a State Records Authority with a much more defined focus on education, policy, standards, and regulation of record keeping amongst public officers, up to and including the point of their board determining retention and disposal. Following that and moving to transfer of state archival material into the collection, that custody and access provision to the state archives collection will novate into the Museums of History Act, enabling the Museums of History New South Wales. And so if we then go up to the top, the text in grey, uh, at an overarching macro legislative level, the State Records Act 1998 becomes the State Records Act whatever year, hopefully 2022, amended. And the Historic Houses Act is repealed 
and that gives birth to the Museums of History Act. I'll go through in some level of detail improvements to the State Records Act. The first improvement is transfer planning. Now, public officers are, are envisaged to, at certain points, be asked to make and implement plans to transfer control and, and potentially custody at the same time of records of enduring value into the State Archives collection, which will be under the control of Museums of History New South Wales. Now, this improved focus and engagement with the transfer process, uh, I mean, there are many, but I've listed a couple here. Improved transfer rates, and that's important, to ensure valuable state records are cared for, and on the agency or public office side, reduce storage and management costs for public offices, both because they'll be transferring material more regularly, we hope, into the state archives collection and not having to pay for physical and or digital storage, but also hopefully that will encourage more frequent sentencing and disposal of material that's no longer in use and not required for transfer. There's also greater visibility of transfer planning, which will ensure services to support transfer, resourcing, capacity for customer service, systems, transport, conservation can be enhanced and planned. And resourcing can be managed on both the public office side and the State Records Authority side and the Museums of History side to ensure more timely response for both transfer and retrieval. Access to archives, a number of seminal changes here. The reduction of the open to access period from 30 to 20 years in line with national and other jurisdictional, both local and international uh, uh, changes that have happened uh, before this review of the Act. Similarly, archives without a close to the public access direction will default open to the public after 20 years. Now, I need to state categorically that the same rights and responsibilities for public officers to set closed directions are in place. But what this does is ensures that uh, a record that doesn't have a, an access direction, either open or closed, and that is in the open to public access period, doesn't sit in limbo waiting for a member of the public who somehow becomes aware that we have custody and control of that and applies for an access direction is considered. What this will do is say, you've got time and the ability to close it if you think it needs to be closed. And if such a direction isn't applied, it will default open after 20 years. And that saves public officers an administrative process. It saves the public from having to apply for an open to public access direction or for an access direction to be placed on a record when they haven't purposefully been opened. So I think that's a tremendous access outcome and, and a great administrative save. But I do need to say categorically the same abilities to close records that are meant to be closed and should be closed exist in, in, in the Act moving forward. And that's my next point. It is still the public office responsible for the records that determines whether the records are closed and, and nothing changes there. As I said at the top of the uh, presentation, there will be a 12-month transitional arrangements for public officers to make such directions or amendments to close records if needed. And all existing closed to public access directions and open to public access directions will remain in place. And we will provide the State Records Authority with transitional funding to increase its staffing to support public officers through this process. The State Records Authority of New South Wales, and I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the creation of SRA New South Wales. The separation uh, of the custodial function to do with the collection and the regulatory and education and standards uh, uh, process and responsibilities for record keeping has been a response to uh, a fair amount of feedback from stakeholders informally, but also formally and on the record through uh, uh, submissions and evidence given at the Social Issues Committee's inquiry. The State Records of Authority of New South Wales will be a statutory body with a board, and that board will have the same role as the current SARA board. The new appointments will be made, uh, there, there is a change to the composition of the board, 
and eight positions um, and appointments will be made by the Minister, with only three positions being prescribed. There must be a representative of history, users of archives and First Nations. Uh, and so within that, uh, the Minister is still responsible for nominating and proposing to the Governor those three positions. There is a position held for the Chief Executive of the Museums of History New South Wales, and the remaining positions appointed uh, by the Governor on recommendation of the Minister are open. So this helps um, in a number of ways. One, the Minister administering this Act makes all the appointment recommendations to the Governor, whereas currently the Minister administering this Act makes roughly half of them, and then the rest are made by a number of different people, sometimes alone, sometimes with consultation, and sometimes jointly. And that slows down the process, uh, and it's often led to vacancies being um, uh, being held for longer than they should be, and, and a critical uh, role and representative not being on the board for some seminal decisions. So this will make the appointment process faster and easier. It responds to feedback from a number of people, including uh, Professor Lucy Caxa, around increasing the representative of archives users on the board, uh, bringing First Nations voice and knowledge onto the board and preserving the need to understand history to be on the board. But it then opens up a number of positions to be more flexible. If you were going through uh, a particular time in the history and you needed to uh, have more represented representatives from, say, justice or police, you'd be able to do that. If universities were going through a big reform and they're currently not represented on the board, you would be able to bring a university representative in. So this ability to fix a number of critical positions but also create more flexibility allows the, the nuances uh, and the cycles of record keeping, uh, regulation and education and upheaval uh, and change in specific sectors to be catered for. So I think that's going to be a, a really excellent change. There's a monitoring power that's being introduced. Uh, being the State Records Authority are able to issue a notice to a public office that requires that they conduct an assessment, that is that the public office conducts an assessment of their record keeping and report of the findings back to the board. This approach improves record keeping outcomes by expanding the powers of SRA, but without creating the burden uh, or the expense or at times the unrealistic expectation of an additional uh, integrity or investigatory bodies. It also keeps costs for both the public office and state records authority uh, at a manageable uh, at a manageable level. There's other minor amendments, including public office definition to increase the clarity of the composition of the jurisdiction to reduce the interpretive nature of that clause that happens now and creates a little bit of confusion. State records definition, removing and kept. Uh, and if you are aware of what the definition is, uh, with a strict reading, uh, there may be a, a hole in that definition and removing the and kept allows it to be a very clear definition around what a state record actually is. And the fact that if you don't keep that state record, it doesn't nullify the definition as covering that once existent state record. Sorry, that might have been confusing for some people, and if it was, uh, I can answer it more clearly during question time. Uh, there will also be a slight amendment to the creating records definition in section 12, uh, where we're removing the underlined full and accurate uh, from the definition, uh, purely because that was uh, a nomenclature at the time in the uh, mid 90s when the act was being consulted on and then, and then uh, drafted towards the later part of the 90s. And this definition is, is more in keeping with contemporary record management and record keeping language. Now, of less relevance uh, uh, to some of you, but more relevance to others, the ICAC Operation Dasher report has seen us adopt a recommendation to increase the penalty provision from uh, 50 to 75 penalty units for breaches of Section 21, which is protection measures under the Act will adopt an increase in time period to bring proceedings under the Act from two to three years. We will not create a new offence as recommended by ICAC for the willful failure to keep records and the willful failure to create records. 
And we have consulted with ICAC and other integrity agencies about the adoption of two recommendations and the non-adoption of that third recommendation. And again, for the record, the non-adoption of that third recommendation doesn't mean we, uh, as an authority, don't agree that that should be an offence, but we do not feel that it has a place in the State Records Act for a number of reasons. Investments for transition. So we are investing and have been investing a lot in, in new tools to support public officers and our team, uh, both in our current Act uh, and implementation of that Act, but also to support people through the current transition that's planned and the new regulatory environment. They include a new website, the records management assessment tool and the upcoming monitoring exercise for which we've had a number of positive responses to and thanks anyone who has uh, come back to us seeking clarification or asking questions or, or seeking support with that. And a public office portal which include information and services for transfer. It will really underpin the transfer planning aspects that I, I genuinely think will be a tonic for both public officers and the State Records Authority moving forward. So my main message here is rest assured, uh, we are investing in supporting you, you and ourselves through this process. Less relevant, I will touch on Museums of History though, for anyone who is interested. The Museums of History New South Wales, which again, uh, to remind you, is made up of the custodial functions of the current State Records Authority and the entirety of the Sydney Living Museum's functions. It will be a statutory body. The executive agency status will be sought by administrative, uh, administrative order. It will have a governing board of 11 members with the CEO of that entity being entitled to attend. Three prescribed members, History, Heritage, First Nations, and the minister will appoint uh, all 11 members uh, and, and need to make appointments for all 11 inaugural members of that governing body uh, by the 31st of December. Sorry for the long pause there, I'm having more technical difficulties. Excellent. Uh, the minor changes related to Museums of History New South Wales will be to come up with new objectives. Uh, and these are draft objectives at the moment. We've been liaising with the Parliamentary Council's Office, uh, but these need to go through Cabinet and, of course, Parliament. So I will skim over these and won't read them in full, but they relate to the collection, management and preservation of the collection writ large of this new organisation, which includes the State Archives collection, first and foremost, in terms of value and uh, size, the 12 uh, museums and other buildings that the current SLM owns, as well as the objects and materials uh, that form the other type of collection that SLM home owns. The objectives will be to increase the public knowledge and enjoyment of and access to the archives and those collections, promoting knowledge and appreciation of history generally, promoting the state archives, buildings and collections in its care, and particularly focusing on the stories and histories that shape social, historical, political and cultural identities of the state, and to achieve set objectives across the state, including in regional and rural New South Wales. There will also be minor changes uh, in terms of a number of clauses in the Sydney Living Museum's Historic Houses Act, as it novates into Museums of History of New South Wales, uh, replacing, importantly, the word historic to significant, which gives uh, the ability of Sydney Living Museums, or as it novates into Museums of History of New South Wales, the dispensation from the notion that it's only collecting colonial era places and buildings and allows uh, such buildings like Rose Seidler House that are already in its care to exist more comfortably with the legislative mandates. And it will also maintain the commercial viability uh, of the current State Archives and Records Authority and Novak that into Museums of History in New South Wales. And so with that, explained, I'll stop sharing my screen so that everyone can see each other a little better and see whether anyone's got any questions. Hi Adam, yeah, so there, there were some questions. I think Stephen Bedford had his hand up originally, um, but he did make a comment. So Stephen, if you want to talk, you can talk. I can read sure. your comment out. Cool. No, thank, thanks very much. Um, I have got the comment in there, but basically 
Um, I think I saw a copy of the white paper. I'm not sure what it was up to. And I was really, really worried about um, the losing full and accurate out of the description um, of a record. And so while I agree that the language was very 1990s, um, and that's no reflection on Angela's husband at all. Sorry, Angela. Um, <laughs> that um, that the danger is it could undermine the entire act. So the real yeah. danger is that someone says, it's someone, you know, a, a public office reads that and thinks, oh, I need to make records of my activities, but, you know, maybe I can pick what I can need to record and what I don't need to record. So um, I would encourage... It's very hard to guard against that. Um, yes. I'd, and, you know, maybe uh, maybe we can, maybe you could deal with it by leaving the full in and and the accurate part being as part of standards that that um, support that act. But yeah. uh, it's, it's extraordinarily co uh, concerning to me. Like it's sort of a huge red flag and there's no way yeah. I would put under a minor change. I would put a major danger, 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 danger change. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. No, not at all. And look, I I, I understand. I might allow um, Catherine or, or Catherine Robinson or Andrew to comment a little bit further, but the notion, because that they, you know, the recommendation for this change did come internally from our team after consultation with a couple of public officers. Um, but the, the, the main uh, approach is exactly as, as you said there, uh, to deal with the notion of what fulsome, or not fulsome, full accurate records might be in the standards uh, underneath, uh, or even in the regulation, but in, in, a, 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 in a, an instrument that allows more regular change and updating than an act would. Uh, so that was the thinking behind it, but I do take your point, um, Andrew, P or, or Catherine, is there anything you wanted to add to that recommendation or to that um, uh, comment? Uh, I, I suppose, I suppose, only in that, like, while there are uh, all of the, you know, all all of the wordings that have that have changed over the years in terms of how uh, that's dealt with within the standards itself, um, I think from an in, from an interpretation perspective, um, it it yields quite little value uh, in terms of what. Of what what we would assess as as proper record keeping or record or record keeping of of what you're conducting, uh, like you know the the functions that you're doing um, in terms of the standard that you're capturing that at, um, and I think that's uh, reared its head in a number of assessments that we've conducted, uh, some which will be public and others won't, um, in that actually having the words there, given the given the strength of everything else around it, um, including public expectation, um, it actually doesn't offer that much value. Um, and it sort of it can uh, it can trip you up, you know, when you're trying to define well, what does full and accurate mean in this very specific instance? Catherine, I can see you with your physical hand. Hi, I was just going to add um, for Stephen's benefit. We actually do look to the definition of what a record is in ISO one five four eight nine. So, in other words, we look to the professional definition held in the international standard. Um, when we're actually looking at whether a record is a record. So full and accurate is really very much of its time, but embedded in our work, because we have adopted ISO 15489 as our code of best practice, that definition of what a record is in the international standard underpins exactly what our understandings are of a record and what it needs to have in order to get the, the gold tick to be a record. So. Um, I wouldn't be too alarmed about the fact that full and accurate is being dropped out of this, the legislation because what underpins the concept of the record is that international standard. I'm still um, alarmed. And the articulation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Please, so, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, look, I'm still alarmed. I, you know, I can understand the needs, the, what you're talking about with full and accurate. I can understand what you're talking about with the standard. But the thing is, we're dealing with people who don't, we're dealing with senior executives who don't necessarily read standards and things like that, mm -hmm. and too like too many layers of abstraction between what we need to do. And this look, this is our core mission. This is our core mission. So there are possible other ways of dealing with it. You know, maybe an insertion of an all in there somewhere. So you know, uh, uh, agencies must make you know, uh, records of all their business transactions or something like that, you know, yeah. just just something to really beef it up and 
uh, be, you know, as I said, this is this is our core function. This is the entire point of the act. And if we don't actually, it's the entire point of the profession. So we, we really need to deal with it from that perspective. I'm sorry to be alarmist and sorry to butt in again. Thank you very much. No, not at all. And look, we are going back and forth with the Parliamentary Council's office to look at these particular aspects of, of the drafting. So we definitely heard the comments. Um, I think you can be rest assured that we are not saying, oh, don't worry about keeping full and accurate records. Uh, don't worry about it. There's no, there's no uh, lowering of the bar uh, around expectations here. I think it's really just tidying up the language. And I take your point that uh, um, as, a, as a kind of uh, as a benchmark of what senior executives uh, need to do and, and, and other uh, public servants and uh, people covered under the State Records Act. So I'll bear that in mind and I'll pass that on to the person leading the drafting to make sure that we can come up with something uh, that, that doesn't um, reduce the perceptions around what good record keeping is. And at the same time, you've got Andrew and Catherine's uh, uh, response there to say that in the standards and in the education material and in the support they provide, that that will be a definitely enhanced part of what we do. Um, Kathy, I think, has a has a question, and I'm, I'm noting that I've only got four minutes, so I will um, uh, pass over to you to ask away. Kathy, you want? No, maybe it's an accidental hand up. That, that's okay. It, yes, maybe. Does anyone else okay, have a question? Yeah, there's. I mean, there's there's one other there's one other comment from uh, from Michael Smith, um, which we might just jump to. Um, uh, I, I mean, I'll just read it out, Michael. Um, it says, splitting SARA into two organisations is a significant shift from what was proposed in the policy paper. The division of responsibilities between the two agencies is contrary to records and archives management best practice, in particular, the continuum model for records and archives management, which is widely accepted throughout Australia. Will there be further public consultation given the extent of this change and have professional bodies such as ASA and RIMPA been consulted? Good question. Um, yes, they have, and no, no further consultation. This came out of the extensive consultation period that the Social Issues Committee uh, ran. Um, so this was an option. The separation option was one that was considered before the Green Paper, the policy paper, uh, was referred to the Social Issues Committee for public uh, comment and, and evidence giving. Uh, and, and it wasn't, it, was, it, it wasn't taken. It was put forward as a uh, straight merger between State Archives and Sydney Living Museums. Um, and what came out of that process, uh, loud and clear, uh, was the perception that uh, the functions of display, reasonably crudely explained, if I, if I can say that, but the, the, the notion that the display of archives and the interpretation of archives would put down the pressure on the regulatory functions and the education functions, and in some cases people were concerned it would change the retention and disposal decisions. So despite me not subscribing to either of those fears, to be perfectly honest, um, it was considered very, very earnestly uh, and the recommendations were taken and the evidence were taken to come up with this policy proposal to separate them, strengthen both, make uh, the State Records Authority an executive agency in its own right and give it all of those new powers so that it had a focus on the regulation and the education and the standards of record keeping and couldn't be susceptible to any perceived or actual change or downward pressure that uh, the return on investment and, and research into the collection, the interpretation of the collection would give. So um, succinctly, no more consultation on that. That is what is before Cabinet now, uh, and it came from an extensive, uh, extensive um, process. Uh, and since then, yes, the ASA, the International Council on Archives President, a number of people have been consulted on this. Uh, and whilst some of those have had feedback about certain parts of the proposal, um, including removal of the words full and accurate, uh, no one has had any concern with the separation model. And in fact, some leading archival thinkers have actually written in the past 
in Australia about this being an optimal model um, for dealing. Chris Hurley, for instance, has written at length about this about this as a as a preferred model in his mind. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, uh, and if not allays your fears, at least answers your questions. Cool. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, so uh, I guess that that's sort of the end. Uh, I guess Adam did touch on uh, in his. Uh, presentation, you know, about the, about the resourcing that will come in to support the changes. Um, so, so obviously, you know, there will be those those legislative changes, um, and the, that will sort of get into the weeds um, a little bit later and and resource the the transition appropriately. So, um, so all of those questions that are probably racing through your mind, um, we'll have answers to uh, in due course. But thank you so much for your time, Adam. Um, Thanks, everyone. So it being. Um,